On September 25th, 1798, George Washington wrote a letter to Reverend G. W. Snyder, where he acknowledges the existence of the Bavarian Illuminati. Washington writes, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati, but never saw the book until you were pleased to send it to me. George goes on to write that he was prevented from acknowledging Snyder's letter after he was in a feverish and debilitated state, and he corrects Snyder on, quote, an error you have run into of my presiding over the English lodges in this country. The fact is, I preside over none, nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. I believe, notwithstanding, that none of the lodges in this country are contaminated with the principles ascribed to the Society of the Illuminati. A month later, Washington writes in a different letter, It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. The idea that I meant to convey was that I did not believe that the lodges of Freemasons in this country had, as societies, endeavored to propagate the diabolical tenets of the first or the pernicious principles of the latter. The Illuminati is a title attached to conspiracies since its conception. It is often used to refer to a secret cabal of occultists and financiers pulling strings behind world government but much of its genuine history and teachings have been overshadowed by these swamp fogs of speculation. And it's now a popular theory that Freemasonry, the world's oldest and largest secret society, is in fact engaged in a nefarious agenda to seize control of global affairs and bring on some version of totalitarian rule. For the sake of clarity, I am a Freemason, raised to my master's degree at a lodge in Virginia Beach. I've attended district conventions, published in Virginia Masonic Magazine, and perused our libraries and temples along the East Coast. But some years before this, I saw how the Freemasons and Illuminati were often mentioned in the same breath, as shadow forces at work against our rights, property, and religions. Once I read two specific books, however, and got involved at my lodge, I knew how absurd this notion was and where it all derived from. And in my Masonic Lodge, these books were in hardback behind a glass case, though few brothers had ever heard of them or knew what they were. The first is Proofs of a Conspiracy by a Freemason and professor of natural philosophy, John Robison, published in 1798. The second is Code of the Illuminati by Augustin Baruel, a Jesuit priest, being the third volume of a series published in 1799. These literary antiques contain the confiscated writings of Illuminese and the founder of the Illuminati. The order did exist, and it all started in Bavaria, Germany, with a man named Adam Weishaupt. At 20 years old, Weishaupt achieved his doctorate at the University of Ingolstadt and became a professor of law at the age of 25 and dean of the faculty of law at 27. His brilliance and impressive status at such a young age made him the object of envy. There's no doubt that Professor Weishaupt was ingenious and cunning, and he is most certainly not one or two dimensional. He lived with many personal secrets and unseemly agendas that have painted him as a villainous thinker no matter how regretful he may have been for these doctrines later in his life. At this time in Europe, ideas of the Enlightenment and Catholic Reformation were captivating elite thinkers in controlling roles in society. Discontentment with the church and the fascination with science was growing, and with it was a contempt for tyrants. The different incarnations of this discontent were of particular interest to an America gained by revolution, an America with many of its founding fathers already initiated in Freemasonry. 
Another incarnation was the French Revolution, which both John Robison and Baruel worked to show was influenced by the Illuminati. This doesn't seem to be a stretch, but the physical links are lacking. Freemasonry at this time was extremely active. Young men with educational and esteemed familial backgrounds in Europe and America were traveling through the lodges at an exciting pace. Indeed, Adam Weishaupt himself became a Freemason in 1777 after certain colleagues of his familiarized him with the order. This was probably Anton von Masonhausen, who became known by his codename in the Illuminati as Ajax. Gradually, Weishaupt poached and borrowed many Masonic principles, ritualistic details, and initiatory oaths, and tailored them to stitch neatly into his own secret society. And as destiny would have it, on May 1st in 1776, Adam Weishaupt founds the Illuminati with Masonhausen and a second student, Max Mers. The essential aims of the secret order are spelled out in various writings, but the following passages from Weishaupt will suffice as an overview. Weishaupt, writing under the codename Spartacus, says, This is the great object held out by this association, and the means of obtaining it is illumination, enlightening the understanding by the sun of reason, which will dispel the clouds of superstition and of prejudice. Proficients of the order are therefore justly named the illuminated, and of all illumination which human reason can give, none is comparable to the discovery of what we are, our nature, our obligations, what happiness we are capable of, and what are the means of attaining it. And what is this general object? The happiness of the human race. Is it not distressing to a generous mind, after contemplating what human nature is capable of, to see how little we enjoy? When we look at this goodly world and see that every man may be happy, but that happiness depends on the conduct of another. When we see the wicked so powerful and the good so weak, and that it is in vain to strive, singly and alone, against the general current of vice and oppression, the wish naturally arises in the mind that were it possible to form a durable combination of the most worthy persons who should work together in removing the obstacles to human happiness, become terrible to the wicked, and give their aid to all the good without distinction, and should, by the most powerful means, lessen vice, would not such an association be a blessing to the world? These are quite lofty aims, and so far there isn't much that paints Weishaupt as a malicious conspirator, but definitely proves his ambition. But very quickly in Baruel's Code of the Illuminati, Weishaupt is presented as a perjurer, embroiled in an abortion scandal that could tarnish his reputation. Weishaupt, in one of his own letters to an adept, Hertel, writes for help in aborting his sister-in-law's child, which is, of course, Adam's child as well. It destroys my rest, he says. It render me incapable of everything. I am almost desperate. My honor is in danger, and I am on the eve of losing that reputation which gave me so great an authority over our people. To demonstrate Weishaupt's status as a perjurer, Baruel reveals an apology written by Weishaupt that states he had never even heard of the secret means of abortion and would never conceive of seeking aid of a friend in that regard and so on. But Baruel never thought too highly of Weishaupt, writing, There sometimes appear men formed with such unhappy dispositions that we are led to consider them in no other view than as emanations from the evil genius bereft by the avenging god of the power of doing good. Imbecile in the sphere of wisdom, such men are only efficient in the arts of vice and destruction. And in many more long pages, we are consistently reminded of how evil a man Weishaupt was to Baruel. Baruel felt perfectly threatened by the Illuminati, defining the order's conspiracy as the conspiracy of the sophisters of impiety and anarchy against every religion, natural or revealed, not only against kings, but against every government, against all civil society, even against all property whatsoever. Now for Weishaupt, 
newly the founder of a secret order with the most lofty aims. He needs followers, initiates, loyalists, and astute minds and persons in the most dominant positions of power and scholastic influence. Weishaupt writes, but where are the proper persons, the good, the generous, and the accomplished to be found? And how, and by what strong motives are they to be induced to engage in a task so vast, so incessant, so difficult, and so laborious? This association must be gradual. There are some such persons to be found in every society. Such noble minds will be engaged by the heartwarming object. The first task of the association must therefore be to form the younger members. One crucial early member was the nobleman Franz Xavier von Zwack, who subsequently replaced Ajax due to the man's prodigious womanizing. With Zwack's help, the Illuminati grew to over 25 members by 1778, and by 1779, they had successfully gained permission to set up a Masonic lodge in the Bavarian capital. The brothers of the Illuminati were instructed to look out for men younger than 30, that age range where education is incomplete, where passions and ambitions are not yet anchored too low, and the sense of a grand pursuit could still seduce one into an exclusive and elite class with perks of pleasure, power, and spiritual wisdom. Nonetheless, Weishaupt admittedly devises ways to withhold, by degrees, what certain candidates most want to know. In his society, the members were not treated equally, and the order by no means possessed all of what it promised. For instance, Weishaupt presented the Illuminati to many of the earliest members as a far more ancient society, governed by a powerful and mysterious unnamed authority above himself. One of the agents tasked with covert recruitment were called the Brother Insinuators, who could be placed in provinces, cities, and other countries to expose the order's sentiments on young minds to run tests and campaigns of domestic and scholastic espionage. But not only intellectuals were deemed valuable, but those who might be called rich and useful idiots. So long as they could be gained over, Weishaupt says, they could be attorneys, doctors, and counselors, officers of princes, schoolmasters, barons, and so forth. But no agent Illumini was ever to give the remotest hint at being a member of the secret order, and they were instructed to master the craft of deceit to that end, avoiding any hint of previous scandal or moral transgression. The Minervals were not supposed to travel even without informing or obtaining permission from superiors. Every Illumini was tasked to keep a methodical diary, Every person engaged with or encountered was an object to be reverse-engineered if it could be of value to the order. The agent was to learn the strengths, weaknesses, vices, and virtues of all those around him by the most subtle and seductive means. Twice a month, a report on these observations was to be sent up the chain. This allowed the high-ranking members to know their agents thoroughly, know who they could and could not rely on, and to know what provinces and institutions they might set up in. And even if some influential candidates were likely to find the true doctrine detestable, these two were vital pieces of information to be added to the ledger. Among some notable members who certainly did not hold with or know of Weishaupt's covert plan included Duke Karl August of Saxe-Weimar, Duke Ernst II of Saxe-Gotha, and Duke Karl Wilhelm Ferdinand of Brunswick. Also, the German intellectuals Johann Wolfgang Goethe and Johann Gottfried von Herder. But it was the Freemason Baron Franz von Knig who helped to catapult the Illuminati's membership to such esteemed persons. And Knig helped Weishaupt devise deceptive histories of the Illuminati in order to be more welcoming to Christians and Masons. Weishaupt set up secrecy as one of the pillars of his order, and we read how Freemasonry made such a lasting impact on him. Except Freemasons are not allowed to actively or secretly recruit as the Illuminati definitely did. Slightest observations, says Weishaupt, 
shows that nothing will so much contribute to increase the zeal of the members as secret union. We see with what keenness and zeal the frivolous business of Freemasonry is conducted by persons knit together by the secrecy of their union. It is needless to inquire into the causes of this zeal which secrecy produces. It is an universal fact, confirmed by the history of every age. The order will thus work silently and securely, and though the generous benefactors of the human race are thus deprived of the applause of the world, they have the noble pleasure of seeing their work prosper in their hands. Now while we can't quote every fascinating writing of Weishaupt's, we turn to passages that paint him in a less favorable light. It's one thing to have grand purposes and plans for the world, and entirely another to devise domineering and devious methods to control your fellow man, let alone the very members of your own order. At one stage in the growth of the Illuminati, Weishaupt acknowledges the importance of a female branch of the order, and lays out what methods of restraint might be placed on them, and how they should never come to know that in truth they were governed invisibly by male superiors. The advantages which the real order would reap from this female order would be, first, the money which the sisterhood would pay at their initiation, and secondly, a heavy tax upon their curiosity, under the supposition of secrets that are to be learned. And this association might, moreover, serve to gratify those brethren who had a turn for sensual pleasure. And Robison tells us there is a list of 85 such prospective women that became the project of Zwack, codenamed Cato. But beyond the cringeworthy machinations to devise his own private harem, Weishaupt complicates the morality of the Illuminati in other places. And here we see the seeds of shadow governance that would ensure the Illuminati's name was forever bound to political conspiracy. Weishaupt writes, when the object is a universal revolution, all the members of these secret societies aiming at the same point and aiding each other must find means of governing invisibly and without any appearance of violent measures, not only the higher and more distinguished class of any particular state, but men of all nations and of every religion insinuate the same spirit everywhere in silence, but with the greatest activity possible direct the scattered inhabitants of the earth toward the same point. Now if Weishaupt was the sole possessor of the civilized truth for all human society, we might not have as many qualms about relinquishing our government and religion over to him, or for that matter those of every nation. But since no man can lord the societal truth over the rabble, Weishaupt is rightly criticized for having the audacity to think he and his highest agents possessed the guide to salvation. But what were Adam's influences to hold on to such a grand purpose? This we can only infer. His sentiments do resonate with contemporary contempt for monarchical politics and the decreasing tolerance for the church among Enlightenment intellectuals. In this way, Weishaupt was quite foreseeing, but he was also not ignorant of the ancient mysteries and the previous secret societies that captivated much of the esoteric Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Babylonian, and Persian worlds. If you were in Weishaupt's time and you were a literary man, you would come across many striking passages about the old mysteries that bear the closest ancient resemblance to modern Freemasonry. Weishaupt, I find, is actually correct in perceiving a collective and happy end to the benevolent spiritual traditions of the world a return to a golden age reminiscent of many older ideas found in Hesiod and Plato's Atlantis. Except, in the end, it isn't exactly clear if Weishaupt was an atheist for a time or if he simply was unwilling to convert to a traditional religion during his glory days as the chief Illumini. Now, the Illuminati's loose and infiltrative ties with Freemasonry have been exaggerated somewhat beyond repair, if you read Robison, you will see in many places the disdain Weishaupt holds for Masonic lodges. In many places, he refers to Masons as thoughtless and idle young men, incapable of committing to a collective political purpose, and certainly not of the skill necessary to unveil their own symbols and rituals. I see, in a sense, where he's coming from to a much less critical degree. 
Freemasons are not any more extraordinary for the most part than your everyday moral and God-loving men, especially today. But no doubt, ennoble characters can and are certainly among the lodges. But if fraternity and a belief in God and a commitment to self-improvement is not enough for a Mason, then the Illuminati would have been an alternative route to a more serious political work. Weishaupt certainly was under the impression then that the framework around Freemasonry provided an opportunity the Masons hadn't capitalized on, namely more secrets, a grander end game, and a global political change. Perhaps if Weishaupt had not been so careless in writing about the necessary destruction of civil society, religion, government, and property, then he would not have made the enemies he did. Thus, where the Masonic thread actually connected to the Illuminati is spelled out in the man's own writings. And as far as the Illuminati surviving into the modern age, such physical links were never found. But the ideological links do exist. They just make for a far less conspiratorial and romantic narrative. Nonetheless, the Illuminati echoed across the sea. And not just George Washington, but Thomas Jefferson, who was minister to France from 1785 to 1789, mentions the Illuminati in a letter to Bishop James Madison, dated January 31st, 1800. The two founding fathers would not seem to be in agreement if we judge by these letters. In Jefferson's letter we read, I have lately by accident got a sight of a single volume, the third of the A. Baruel's Antisocial Conspiracy which gives me the first idea I have ever had of what is meant by the Illuminatism. Baruel's own part of the book are perfectly the ravings of a bedlamite. As you may not have had an opportunity of forming a judgment of this cry of mad dog, which has been raised against his doctrines, I will give you the idea I have formed from only an hour's reading of Baruel's quotations from him, which you may be sure are not the most favorable. Weishaupt seems to be an enthusiastic philanthropist. He is among those who believe in the indefinite perfectibility of man. He thinks he may in time be rendered so perfect that he will be able to govern himself in every circumstance so as to injure none, to do all the good he can, to leave government, no occasion to exercise their powers over him, and of course, to render political government useless. Weishaupt believes that to promote this perfection of the human character was the object of Jesus Christ, that his intention was simply to reinstate natural religion and by diffusing the light of his morality to teach us to govern ourselves. His precepts are the love of God and love of our neighbor, and by teaching innocence of conduct, he expected to place men in their natural state of liberty and equality. He says no one ever laid a surer foundation for liberty than our Grand Master Jesus of Nazareth. He believes that Freemasons were originally possessed of the true principles and object of Christianity and have still preserved some of them by tradition, but much disfigured. Jefferson continues to say that Weishaupt knew from living under the tyranny of despots and priests that spreading knowledge of morality was a cautious affair. Jefferson says he proposed to initiate new members into this body by gradations proportioned to his fears of the thunderbolts of tyranny. This has given an air of mystery to his views, was the foundation of his banishment and the subversion of the Masonic order, and is the color for the ravings against him by Robison, Baruel, and Morse. I believe you will think with me that if Weishaupt had written here, in America, where no secrecy is necessary in our endeavors to render men wise and virtuous, he would not have thought of any secret machinery for that purpose. This perspective of Weishaupt's character comes after Duke Carl Theodore Bavaria issued an edict on June 22, 1784, that prohibited all secret societies not expressly authorized by the government and other former members were also denouncing the Illuminati for its anti-religious sentiments. Even so, we have Weishaupt writing in a letter to Zwack, I have considered everything, and so prepared it, that if the order should this day go to ruin, I shall in a year re-establish it more brilliant than ever. But now nature herself intervenes and alters the history of the Illuminati irrevocably. On July 10th, 
1785, lightning struck and killed Johann Jacob Lang, a Catholic priest and member of the Illuminati. In Lang's pockets, the police found Illuminati letters and documents, and for the first time, the authorities actually have the words of the secret order itself. This lightning strike led to the first arrests and fueled an investigation on Zwack. And in October 1786, the Bavarian police raid Zwack's home in Munich. Zwack had already left Bavaria, but fortunately for history, and unfortunately for the Illuminati, did not destroy letters to Weishaupt and many notebooks and Illuminati paraphernalia. Zwack was totally compromised now. The items confiscated or discovered by the police included personal notes on suicide and praising atheism, notes on the female order, instructions on preparing invisible ink, potions, fake seals, how to procure abortion, and how to arouse women with an uncontrollable sexual desire. Now, while not all these had anything to do with the Illuminati, did not fare well for the society. Zwack's various Illuminati writings were published by the government, and the Duke of Bavaria ordered the arrest of Masonhausen and Weishaupt. But Duke Ernst II, a member of the Illuminati, comes to Weishaupt's aid. This all marked the beginning of the end of Weishaupt's Illuminati at its height grew into a membership of over two and a half thousand. Weishaupt went on to live in protection and even gained a pension in 1808 from Bavaria's own Academy of Sciences. Weishaupt is said to have reconciled with the Catholic Church as well and went on to publish many works of little popularity and an apology for his Illuminati. In hindsight, we can see how Jefferson's more sobering stance of Weishaupt is understandable. After all, Weishaupt was still just young enough to make mistakes and repent for them later. He had a wife as well, and many children, and died in Gotha, Germany in 1830. Although Robison and Baruel try to persuade us that such ideologies as Illuminism impacted the French Revolution, which would have likewise affected the entirety of Europe and all the world from there on, it is very unlikely Weishaupt played any direct role. There were many secret societies and many new political ideas springing up in the world at that time. Thus, about Adam Weishaupt, we may never know how effective his efforts were beyond his death. But in the end, if his aims were genuine and his apologetic late life was sincere, however deceptive his means may have been, he would probably want the world to focus on the general hopes he had for mankind and not so much the schemes he employed to get there.